Much of modern medicine is built upon the achievements of scientists throughout history. And though technology has helped speed up some progress, certain practices, like anesthesia, have served the same purpose no matter the year. Its first use can be traced back to ancient times, then in Europe during the 1200s, where plants were used to provide pain relief during surgical procedures. Now, modern anesthesia is a combination of drugs all designed for one outcome. We use the most uh, powerful drugs known to man to disarm your central nervous system, and it prevents pain from being transmitted to your brain and from you feeling the pain. That's Dr. James Cottrell, a professor of anesthesiology and chairman emeritus at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University in Brooklyn. He says that while these drugs are great at stopping pain, each one comes with its own risks. That's why it's so important for patients to divulge their medical history and any previous experiences with anesthesia. This information lets doctors know which drug combination will work best, a recipe that's always changing depending on the patient and type of anesthesia being used. If we're using a general anesthesia, that's with inhalation and intravenous, we could use as many as 10 to 15 drugs. If we use a regional anesthesia, like a spinal or an epidural, we generally only use one drug, and that's a local anesthetic. There are three main types of anesthesia. Local, which is injected into a specific part of your body. Regional, which is used to numb a large portion of the body that's undergoing surgery. And general anesthesia, in which the patient is unconscious for the procedure. There are risks that come with each option, but Cottrell says it's not something that many patients want to talk about. As a neuroanesthesiologist, he saw firsthand the lack of knowledge patients had about a very serious part of their procedures. I got tired of going to the clinic, the pre-op clinic, every morning and asking patients if they wanted to talk about anesthesia. And they would say, no, doc, I don't want to know anything about it. Just put me out. And of course, that's the wrong thing to say and do to protect yourself and to get the kind of anesthesia and pain relief you need and deserve during surgery. In an effort to combat patient ignorance, Cottrell wrote the book, Anesthesia Without Fear, The Informed Consumer's Guide to Safe Surgery and Chronic Pain Relief. It's a tool for patients to understand the ins and outs of anesthesia. Like, for example, what does an anesthesiologist do during surgery? We have to keep you alive while the surgeons do things that would otherwise kill you. We have to control your breathing. We have to control your heart rate. We have to make sure your perfusion, your oxygen saturation is normal, how much oxygen's in your blood and the carbon dioxide, how well you're eliminating that or breathing out the carbon dioxide. So we have to keep all that within a normal range in order to keep you alive during the surgery. We have a monitor for oxygenation in the blood that we put on your finger. We have an exhaled monitor that tells how much carbon dioxide is coming out. And if you have some serious illnesses, then we have specialized heart monitors that we can put on your chest, like an echo, which is sound waves that go through your chest and then tells me what's going on in your heart during the anesthetic. If something happens to go wrong, like high blood pressure, Cottrell has to search for the individual drug causing the issue and then fine tune that specific dosage. Like if the heart rate is too slow during an inhalation anesthetic, then you decrease the amount of inhalation anesthesia you're delivering. If the heart rate's too fast during an intravenous anesthetic, then you know you need to give more narcotic or more drug that prevents you from feeling pain, because that's usually what causes your heart rate to go up. Each drug in the anesthesia affects a different system in your body, which also means that each one comes with a different risk and side effect. Some of the most common side effects are nausea and vomiting. But Cottrell says many of the newer anesthetic drugs actually prevent those reactions. Patients just have to be clear before surgery as to their personal and family history with anesthesia. There's one drug called odocitron. And I can give that drug intravenously to someone who has a history of nausea and vomiting, and they won't have nausea and vomiting when they wake up. And there's lots of those kinds of drugs to prevent nausea and vomiting. Certain surgeries cause nausea and vomiting, like strabismus in children. That generally causes nausea and vomiting. So we know to give them something before the surgery so that they won't have nausea and vomiting postoperatively or after the operation. Though the side effects aren't solely dependent on the anesthesia, patients can take matters into their own hands before surgery to make sure the procedure is successful. 
Well, I think you certainly don't want to smoke before you come for an anesthetic. You don't want to use recreational drugs before you come for an anesthetic. And you don't want to eat any solid foods for six hours before the anesthetic or the operation. Cottrell says ingesting solid foods can sometimes stimulate the vomiting reflex while you're going under. And then you could vomit and then suck that into your lungs. And that's not a good thing. So if there's nothing in your stomach, then you wouldn't be able to do that. As Cottrell mentioned earlier, the type and amount of anesthesia used during surgery is tailored to each patient. One of the first things he looks at to make that determination is a person's age. When you're very young, you have a high metabolic rate and you have a low oxygen volume in your lungs. So we have to be very careful about the amount of oxygen we give you. And also we have to be careful about not giving you too little because with your high metabolic rate, you're going to metabolize that more quickly. Now, if you're older, then you'll need less anesthesia. So we have to be careful and give you less anesthesia. And we know that some of the inhalation anesthetics may cause some amnesia and delirium after your operation. So when you wake up, you can be delirious and it could last for a while. And just as the type of anesthetic changes depending on the person, Cottrell says the type of anesthesiologist also changes. There are around eight different subspecialties in anesthesia, with each discipline educated in a different area of surgery. So if you're going to have cardiac anesthesia, open heart surgery, you need to ask for a cardiac anesthesiologist. I'm a neuroanesthesiologist, so if you're going to have craniotomy or spine surgery, you should ask for a neuroanesthesiologist. And even more important is if your child is going to have pediatric surgery, make sure you ask for a pediatric anesthesiologist because children are very delicate and you have to be very careful giving them an anesthetic. So the pediatric anesthesiologist is really armed to take care of those potential complications. Cottrell says that no matter what, everyone should talk with their anesthesiologist before their surgery. Request it that you get to talk with your anesthesiologist and then you can tell the anesthesiologist all the problems you might have. And he or she then can take that into consideration when you're going under. Also ask what kind of anesthetics are available. You know, if you're going to have a hip replacement or a hip fracture fixed, you can have a general or you can have a regional and then ask them to explain to you the difference. Because if you're older and have a general anesthetic, then you may get the delirium I talked about earlier and you can get cognitive dysfunction from that as well. So you want to choose a spinal or an epidural anesthesia for your hip replacement. So the anesthesiologist should be able to talk with you about what's the best anesthetic for your condition. Cottrell's book, Anesthesia Without Fear, is available now wherever books are sold. You can find more information about Dr. James Cottrell and all of our guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. For more behind the scenes, follow Radio Health Journal on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our writer-producer is Kristen Farah. Our production manager is Jason Dickey. I'm Nancy Benson. This segment was brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. If you've had COVID, you can get it again. And next time, it could be worse, especially for those 50 or older or with a chronic condition. An updated vaccine gives you better protection from COVID's worst outcomes. Find COVID vaccines near you at vaccines.gov. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. I mean, who knows what amazing mines we've lost to coal mines and these kind of places where access and resources kept great opportunity from being developed within individuals. A new policy that will help create equal access of knowledge. Then is COVID the new flu? That's the goal. We live with it perhaps seasonally, but we cannot let our foot off the gas and we have definitely gone too far in the other direction. All that and more on Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence, the producer and host of Radio Health Journal. If you like listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. They're on a very fixed light-dark cycle, even in space, even though they're going around the Earth every 90 minutes, and so their day-night cycle is a 90-minute cycle. The ways in which astronauts sleep in space 
Damn. It's indescribable what a person goes through as an innocent man being charged with very, very serious crimes. Every year, innocent people in the U.S. are convicted of serious crimes they didn't commit and sentenced to years in prison. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Radio Health Journal and Viewpoints on your favorite radio station. And subscribe and listen anytime on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal.